Hey everyone, good morning. So my name is Emil Sundukov, and I'm a computer scientist uh, using my skills to solve problems in healthcare. So today we'll be speaking about the trends in healthcare. Hence, it won't be any golden formula, but we'll have a glimpse insight on what's happening there and how we can use the 21st century screwdriver, which is IT competence, to solve the problems and to unlock the hidden value of health data. So let's start with the first one. So uh, why do we need computers? Because we'll be talking there and here about computers today. So we need computers to solve the problems in our life, basically to automate, to, to automate the iterative actions that we perform in our everyday life, as it is seen on the, on the screen here with the two, uh, two men, <laughs> one, one riding the bike, another one using the power of computerized system to go up on the hill. And uh, so in the introduction part, we'll be also tackling why we're speaking about computers and why it can help us in problem solving and helping us to speed up and fuel up such a conservative industry as healthcare. So one of the factors for sure is the size of computers. So we went from the large computers and still stayed there, but we also have now something much more smaller. As you can see here, we can see the one cent coin, and upon that we can see a computer, a real computer that can feel that can sense a dozens of different uh, parameters, uh, save it, and also send it to uh, some other computers for analytics and for you know doing something towards uh, problem solving. Another one is for sure the way how we speak. So now we're using English to interact with uh, you and the virtual space of the auditory, but uh, nevertheless, computers are also using the language, and we're using the language to talk with computers. So these are programming languages. So we went from the math instructions, strict math algorithmic instructions, upon something very high level, which can give an ability to everyone sitting in the room here or sitting you know, in, in front of a computer or, or, or a mobile phone to create an algorithm to solve any problem they would like to solve. And we, we uh, stop upon something like that, <laughs> which is uh, Massachusetts uh, Institute's cr uh, creative framework called Scratch, where the kitten can run and we can put the different blocks with the commands, with a set of commands to uh, program and tell the cat what to do. And we can extrapolate the same principle of work towards sensors, towards computers, towards mobile phone, in order to program certain algorithm to get data, to get sense about the world we live in, to analyze this data, and to perform some actions. And uh, we touch base another thing, another ability that we gave to computers, ability to feel, ability to sense the world around it. So the same what happens with the mole on the, on the slide, <laughs> which is blind. Uh, that is blind. But basically, the ability to feel, which is being given by his sensors on the nose, allows him to fill the world around, to find the food, home, to find neighbors, or to find a Tinder match uh, for his own. <laughs> so the same we give to computers. We, we can now give and attach tons of different sensors to sense the world, and in addition to that, to sense the vital signs. And uh, for sure, the application went like, you know, to the sides of the world. So we have tons of different applications where we can perform and where we can attach and deploy computerized systems now, starting from smart bridge bridges, ending up with you know, uh, smart buildings, roads, and whatsoever happens on the slide. But we'll be talking about he healthcare today. So uh, if you stop for a second and you look on yourself, uh, you might see not only yourself, but you might uh, see yourself and perceive yourself as a data source, as a source of data. The same thing I have in my pocket, the mobile phone, storing tons of different messages, photos, videos, files, whatsoever, the same happens in our body. So we do save and we do generate a lot, a lot of different types and different metrics. Uh, so imagine what would happen if we would use computerized systems, if we would use the ability to sense that we gave to computers to read this data, to read this code, to analyze it and to perform actions uh, in order to uh, prolong or make our life uh, quality much higher. And if we're speaking about such conservative, um, conservative sphere or industry, for sure the pipeline of bringing the technology and innovation 
in, uh, in healthcare industry is very long. So it's one of the longest one. And uh, it's not like you know, the B2C app that we can code and just ship it on App Store and validate this right away. So we need to be sure in multiple, multiple, multiple stages that we are right, that our technology actually solves the problem and, do not, and doesn't harm people. So uh, and uh, this is actually where uh, you must have heard about artificial intelligence for sure, which touch, touch, touch base uh, different examples on what we can do with that. Thanks. And uh, the pipeline there, we can use AI to analyze the data coming from ourselves to, in order to categorize this, in order to make sense out of it, and in order to predict what can happen. And this is being widely used in clinical trials now. So basically clinical trials, when there is a new drug coming out, and we need to understand how to tackle certain, uh, certain pathogen or certain disease with, a, with a different molecules, with a different drug candidates, we can bring in a drug stores in five, seven years in a classical way to treat people. And this is what AI helps us to do. Basically, we created general adversarial networks in order to help us to scale the amount of data to thousands and millions of entries and to help us to find the potential cure within different, uh, different disease groups. But in order to speak about AI, we should speak about the way how we can fuel it up. You might have heard about the term, which means data is a new oil. So it was uh, first published by The Economist three or four years ago already. But nevertheless, the same principle comes in the healthcare. And there are tons of challenges that we need to solve in order to power up and speak about the black mirror technologies. So the first of all is the lack of data. Basically, we speak about that uh, the healthcare data, which is quite interesting to talk about actually, is siloed. What does it mean? Basically, it's been unharmonized and, and saved onto multiple, multiple, multiple institutions across the country or across the world. So if you look at yourself, your simple example, you must have you know, performed a lab analysis, you must have gone to the checkup programs, you must have had surgeries or any other interventions in hospitals, and this data lays in multiple institutions, basically not giving us the full availability to tackle and to take this data into one place and understand what's happening and to generate insights. But the principle there lays in the industry is that we're speaking about unlocking this hidden potential, basically bringing data together, but on the same side, saving the privacy and regulatory pathways in order to speak about that we cannot harm people, we cannot you know, just tell loudly about anyone sitting in the room being, uh, you know, having a certain disease or having certain you know, risks. And uh, this, um, this golden balance that we need to perform by using technology is very interesting. So basically now we're speaking about not just bringing data into one place, which might have pop up in your head once we're speaking about you know, the siloed data, but leaving data where it is and creating an ecosystem where everyone Every stakeholder, starting from a simple hospital, the biobank, institute, or any other patient organization, and also us as a society members, can tackle in, step forward, and participate proactively in generating new insights in a, in a sphere of healthcare by using technology. And uh, we, we were speaking about connected health principle, basically how we can not only look at ourselves as one individual, as one source of data, but how we can connect within everyone sitting in the room, or everyone sitting on the, in, a, in front of the laptop or in front of a smartphone there. And using data, not only looking as a microscope on, one, on myself as an example, on my vital signs or risks, but looking to the whole population of Latvia or different countries. And this brings us to the principle that, imagine this every dot is there is, there is me, there is you, there is your friends or relatives or your course mates. And by connecting this all together, we can bring something like that, something much more brighter and beautiful as a, you know, as a, as a painting like that. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're speaking more and more about not only attaching smart technologies to one individual, but basically how we can interconnect them. And this, this topic, for sure, was outlined once again during the COVID pandemics. How we can use the power of wearables, the power of individuals stepping in proactively to gather data in real time, to connect data from everyone doing the same, and to generate insights, to generate, to stratify risks, to understand what is the risk zone, what are the risk factors, and how we can tackle them timely. And there are a couple of examples, very interesting examples, what are doing in the world. It's like an example of the University of South California using, using cardiogram to What's your heart telling you to answer this question? Actually, right now, I'm sharing my data with the University of South California by using my smartwatch. 
why I'm doing this? Because I would like not only to understand myself as a, risk, as a complex of risk factors towards cardiovascular diseases, but also step in and connect with researchers by using my phone and smartwatch and to tackle the disease, the, this disease together by their competence and by my data. And this is what's done by 300,000 people across the world. And they're using this to generate new insights towards fighting the CVD. Uh, the next example is happening actually here in Baltics. So the group of scientists uh, and also IT companies created Screening.lv, which is tackling the same topic towards breast cancer, where uh, now 3,000 female participants in Latvia are proactively taking part into this initiative, which is quite interesting. That in the pocket or in, your, uh, in a woman's bag, you can find a smartphone, which is not only the way how you can understand the risks, but also have a digital bridge between scientific community tackling the disease and each individual taking part into that. And uh, for sure, we'll speak in one of the factors, we'll speak about the trends in tech and also uh, how we can bring the technology there is about the privacy. So we talk a lot about, hey, why don't we just put the data all together, just classify this, just analyze this and generate tons of different insights. That's cool. You know, I'm a tech person, that sounds really cool. But from another part of the point, the privacy is there. So we need to, uh, the classical healthcare system is not being proactively engaging the individuals, patients or society members into the process of research or treatment. By this I mean that there, are, there should be instruments introduced, such as like proactive or digital, digitized content management, which can allow researchers to send invites to every one of us to take part into the research projects and uh, to, uh, basically to give permission and understand what, for what purposes, why, when, and where our data that generated from our body will be used into the research projects. Another, another topic for sure is virtual reality. I would just outline a couple of vectors just for you to, you know, to, uh, to, to gain interest into, into one, one another sphere of, of, uh, of tech. Another for sure topic is virtual reality. So you must have seen the visualizations, you know, the gaming experience, which is used in rehabilitation, etc. cetera. But it's what, what is very important, if you leave non-healthcare example in the sphere and just leave it there, there might have, see, there might have happened that people would find uh, a way how to use this to, uh, for rehabilitation for their healthcare. This is an example of big screen. There is an open source uh, app where you can basically create a, a, a theater or a room and you can watch movies together with your friends. And which, which is interesting, in this year during COVID time, <laughs> it was the, uh, people started using this as a room for uh, psychology sessions. Why? Because everyone has their mask or avatar on their face. No one knows what is the real face of yours. And you can share what, is, you know, what are the problems during your everyday life, or, you know, what, have, what do you have in your head, with, uh, with just people sitting and watching, I'm not sure what's that, but some kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> some kind of animation movie together with you. Another topic for sure is that how we can generate this data, this fuel, in a more and more and more passive way from one side, in a robust way, but from another point of view, in order to proactively engage every one of us. And there is a hidden value in, in, uh, in voice data for sure. So the company like Amazon, Microsoft, Apple Health now is also tackling this topic very interesting. And a couple of examples just you know, to gain you interest is uh, within the Alexa. So Alexa just launched the healthcare, uh, healthcare and voice industry uh, last year, and one of the examples there is uh, they're using this to refill the pharmacy. Basically, once you wake up, it's a it, it asks you, hey, good morning, Emil, how do you feel? Would you like to refill your, your drugs? Hey, just go ac across the corner, across the street, and you will get there in a, you know, in a Saulus Update or wherever it is in the US. And uh, another topic for sure is how we can engage people and gain more trust and uh, basically proactively generate data by talking with people. Because in the hospital, people are not being located in the hospital all the time. So once they leave the hospital, there's a black box where we can generate insights by using the tech. And one of the examples of the Children's Hospital uh, of Boston, that they use voice data to help during the rehabilitation of children after the surgery. So basically, they create a routine every, every morning once, the, once parents wake up, uh, Alexa is talking to parents and, and saying, hey, it is day three, you should you know, be aware of this and that, you should do this and that, and basically guide people about this. 
Another topic for sure is chatbot, chatbots. If you go to Facebook or Instagram, you will see tons of different you know, automation tools and scripts that can answer you the questions. But how we can use this in healthcare, just as an example, is Ask Maya, which was used in Malaysia to help and educate women on the topic of uh, oral contraceptives. The, the, the thing there is that the stigma exists, especially in the region of Malaysia, and they, they uh, had problems with overdosing or not using the drugs correctly. So that's why Bea, together with a tech company, created a chatbot to engage f uh, female participants, to engage women, and connect them with a chatbot called Maya to gain the trust and to help them just to ask whatever they want and wherever they would like to ask uh, questions about using this kind of medication. And uh, another topic of yours, I see already the timer, thanks a lot. Uh, another topic for sure is not only the lack of data, but what is interesting is also oversaturation with data. You must have heard a lot about uh, digital detox. So basically we have tons of different social media, tons of different tools that we are interacting with, and we don't have time just to relax, take it easy, breathe out, close our eyes, and not using the digital tools at all. But, which is interesting, the same happens in healthcare data as well. So we generate enormous amount of data. And it's not only the healthcare data when we come into the hospital where we've seen the infographic of ourselves as a data source, but also the concept called human as a sensor. So basically how we can use every one of us as a, as a sensor, as a temperature sensor, as a noise sensor, as a... Um, I don't know, earthquake sensor, et cetera, or also as a pandemic sensor. And there are interesting examples of um, University of New York in Texas and uh, basically using Twitter data to generate real-time pandemic spread during the flu outbreak. Basically, they were using, uh, they were using tweets with a hashtag, hey, you know, headache, hey, temperature in October and November, and also using geotag, geolocation of this tweet where it, it's coming from. So basically, imagine you have a real-time map tackling different pandemic and the tackling basically the outspread of disease in real time, which is enormous potential. But nevertheless, if we tackle into the social sphere and tackle into this data, we might have seen a lot of noise. And by noise, I don't mean noise, uh, which is, uh, you know, the singer, <laughs> noise MC, but the noise coming to the data. So we have enormous, enormous amount of data coming there, and we need to understand what matters. So basically, in order to uh, outline this challenge, uh, I, will, I, will, I will quote one of the TED Talks there. Uh, so, okay. So the 21st century, so imagine like after 10 years, your child's coming to you and he's saying, hey, hey dad, or hey mom, what's up? And uh, you're telling, hey, okay, if you answer one question, I will buy you iPhone 25 or whatever it is there. He says, okay, just, you know, just pop it out. And you say, hey, who is Beethoven? And your child basically uses the voice assistant, whatever there, and say, hey, Alexa, hey, Siri, who is Beethoven? And what he receives there is the Beethoven, the composer, and the Beethoven, the movie star. So what should he choose? <laughs> By this, I mean that uh, we have so much data there, and we need to understand what actually matters in a certain context. And the same happens not only with the Beethovens there, <laughs> but also with the data points, with the data, also with the health data. We cannot just, you know, tackle this. Okay, interesting. Siri answered me. So in order to, to just you know, give you a glimpse about that and the call to action, hey, please always look ac across the fence. By this I mean that every competence that you have, and you must, you know, you, you most probably are uh, attached to the, to the university or to certain industry, don't stop into your own yard, which is computer science, which is medicine, which is social science, whatever. Always look, look across the fence to use your competences to solve the problems in the next yard happening somewhere across the street or nearby. Don't be only tech guided. This is one of the things that always the conferences tackle. Hey, how we can apply tech like blockchain, AI, mobile devices, chatbots to, to do something. No, you need to go another way around. You define the problem and use this as a tool, the same as the screwdriver I mentioned in the, in the beginning of the presentation. The same as you uh, would like to screw the, the furniture in your house, you first need to understand where would you like to put it and how do you like to see this, and basically then you screw this up. And yeah, join us to drive the tech in healthcare together. So uh, please, uh, let's keep in touch. I would be happy if you have any ideas or any questions, just tackle us in social networks or uh, whatever it is to, uh, to talk about healthcare and how we can use technology there. So uh, yeah, thanks a lot and uh, wish you a very productive day.